All right, hello and welcome everyone. I'm Robert Baharian and this is Masters in Investing. I'll get the disclosure out of the way first. The information contained in this show is of a general nature. It does not take your specific needs or circumstances into consideration, so you should look at your own financial position, objectives and requirements and seek financial advice before making any financial decisions. My guest today is Chris Breike, founder and CEO of Australia's first and leading online investment advisor. Chris, welcome and thanks for joining me today. Thanks. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Chris, true or false, you're 10 years old. Your father gave you a newspaper, asked you to pick a company to invest in. You chose to invest in Savage Resources, a mining company. You owned it for five months, sold it for a 22% profit. After you sold it, the stock plunged 50%. When you asked your father for the money, he responded by... And, and told you that he never actually invested in the company. True or false? Well, if it's not true, it's a very good story you've just made up there. But no, uh, you've done your research. It's, yeah, in fact, true. Yeah, I um, started investing as a 10-year-old kid because my dad um, gave me a newspaper and, and kind of uh, gave me a bit of an overview of what the share market was and that you could own a piece of a company, which seemed very exciting at the time. And um, me and my little brother, who was, I think, eight at the time, both got to pick a company. Um, clearly it sort of showed our, our, our different risk, uh, taking, uh, yeah, willingness. I think he picked Woolworths, uh, you know, a safe, stable consumer, staple business. And I picked, uh, yeah, a risky mining company. Um, and, and yeah, unfortunately after what we thought was, uh, you know, a great profit that we'd made, dad, uh, turned around and told us it was all just a hypothetical exercise. <laughs> and if we, we actually wanted to invest in the share market, we we're going to have to do a lot of chores. Yeah. Fair enough. I'm, I'm sure he's right. Uh, true or false, 1999 to 2003, you participated in the uh, student stock picking contest. You won three out of the four years against 40,000 40, students. True or false? Yeah, I think that's about right. Yeah, during school, there was this ASX share game. I always thought it was uh, a better way of potentially making some money than working at Woolworths like all my friends were. So I'd enter it in the hope of making the $2,000 in prize money, which I was lucky enough to make a few times. Uh, final true or false, was that pure speculation or real investing, Chris? Well, I mean, at the time, I thought I was, a, you know, an investment sage like Warren Buffett to be able to turn around such a great profit in six weeks. But yeah, I mean, since then, I've learned that it was just a very, I mean, lucky speculation. I picked the most risky shares and um, yes, yeah, some of those times got, got lucky and, and uh, did better than all the other kids that were probably just buying BHP and, and not, not taking enough risk. You... When you finished up school, you joined uh, UBS where you were uh, managing the bank's balance sheet. Can you, can you give us a bit of a background, Chris, as to, as to what you were doing at UBS? And then what was your aha moment and what actually triggered you to then set up StockSpot? And what is StockSpot? What does it do? And how is it so different to what UBS does? Sure. Yeah, that's a few questions. So yeah, I mean, to kind of wind back. Um, yeah, as a kid, I traded for myself and learned, you know, learn a lot about the share market, like making and losing money on my own um, throughout high school and uni. Um, then at university, I, I was really lucky. I got a job, um, a part time job because I was studying three days a week, um, trading at a family office hedge fund. Um, basically, I got a small pot of money that I could buy and sell shares on behalf of the fund. Um, and, and that sort of helped me learn a little bit more about more sophisticated trading strategies than probably what you'd do on your own. Um, and I think that exper experience helped me get an internship originally at UBS. Um, and after doing a summer internship, um, yeah, I remember they gave us a piece of paper and said, look, if, if there are any, if, if you got to pick an area of the bank that you wanted a job in, if we offer you a grad role, where would you like to work? Um, and I think there was like probably five different lines of different areas you could write. Um, but I only wrote one area. I just wrote uh, proprietary trading. That's the only area I want to do. Um, and I think mainly because it was the end of a bull market, um, because they wouldn't usually take graduates into that area. Um, they said, yes, they, they let me be the junior in that team. You know, initially, you know, probably doing a lot of work for the other traders and, and research and, you know, some of the more administrative stuff. Um, but then eventually after a couple of years, yeah, I got to take on more and more responsibility um, you know, learning and then trading different um, strategies. So um, the bank basically had a segregated team of people who weren't looking after the client's money, but actually looking after the bank's money. 
Uh, we had to sit away from all of the trading floor traders because there was a Chinese wall. They, you know, they, they didn't allow us to hear the flows that, you know, the um, clients were, that were doing obvi for obvious reasons that we weren't allowed to front run. Um, but we had, I basically had to come up with strategies to, um, you know, profit from the share market and other assets and across different asset classes um, in a consistent and, you know, hopefully low risk way. And so each person in the team had different strategies that they managed. So as a junior, I managed, um, you know, one of the strategies I managed was uh, cross-listed arbitrage, which was basically looking at companies that are listed in both Australia, you know, and the US and the UK and, and Canada, and then trading these shares between the different exchanges to try and lock in profit. Um, so for instance, BHP is listed in, you know, the US and the UK or, or different mining shares like Paladin Resources or Equinox Resources. I was trading these in the day as well as the night. I was getting up at 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. trading them for a bank. Um, yeah, I mean, on to your next question, I guess the, the lesson I learned was that in order to be, a, you know, a sophisticated um, trader, I mean, it takes, first of all, a lot of experience and learnings and, and hard lessons um, but also, I think I learned at the bank that there's only a very small number of people that consistently make profit from the market. Um, you know, these people that are basically, um, the, you know, the, the, the very well-equipped, um, you know, sophisticated traders that are arbitraging opportunities or, you know, quickly jumping onto new price information. Um, but it also made me realize that most of the people out there that think that they are, you know, clever invest or clever traders are actually just gambling because they don't really have any edge. They don't have any extra skill in order to um, consistently make profit from the market. And although they might get lucky once or twice, you know, in the long run, they probably weren't going to be successful. So I think that was an observation. And then I, I would often go to the big board meetings at, at UBS where they'd invite CEOs of the big businesses in, um, you know, around earnings days. So for instance, the CEO of Coca-Cola or West Farmers would come in. And I remember sitting in these big boardrooms where there would be 20 or 30 or 40 other very, or well, 40 very intelligent fund managers in that room, all trying to determine whether, you know, Coca-Cola was a buy or a sell. Um, and, and, I, and I just thought, look, th these people are all extremely smart. I mean, they're all smarter than me. They've you know, all done sort of doctorates in finance and, you know, clearly understand how to manage spreadsheets. You know, I, I don't understand how they can all get it right and work out whether Coca-Cola is a buy or a sell because, you know, for some of them, they're going to probably say it's a buy and they're going to be overweight Coca-Cola in their portfolios. Some of them are probably going to think it's overvalued and it's a sell. But, you know, it's probably going to be 50-50 and half of them are going to be right and half of, half of them are going to be wrong. I, I think that moment of sitting in that boardroom made me realise what I, I later discovered is known as the paradox of skill, which is that, um, you know, when you are in a competition that's very competitive, you know, whether it's a poker table or, or the share market, um, once competition gets to a certain level, it no longer becomes about how skill you, skillful you are on an absolute level, um, but it becomes more of a relative skill game. And unfortunately, investing has become one of these games where it's become so professional over the last 40 years that it's no longer about how smart you are or how skillful you are because there's so many other smart people out there. Um, and, and for me, that's what, I guess, um, helped me learn about um, index investing you know, as an alternative to trying to time the market or pick stocks, to me, it seemed quite sensible that you could piggyback off all of that hard work everyone else was doing and get access to the prices that they were determining at a very, um, you know, for a very cheap price. Um, you essentially don't have to pay for all the hard work they're doing. Um, and and, and for, to me, it, it sort of seemed a bit unusual that everyone was going through this hard process of picking stocks and timing the market that you know, most of them weren't doing very well when they could be freeloading off all the hard work everyone else was doing and buying an index instead. Um, so I think that got my, um, you know, the juices flowing and, and the ideas sort of starting. I, I think at the point that I decided to start Stockspot, um, which was a business that was, you know, focused on helping mum and dad investors or just, you know, anyone in Australia um, build a very sensible index portfolio. Um, ETFs in Australia, or all these listed index funds were only at about $8 billion in size. And it, struck me that that was nowhere near what it should be um, compared to other markets like Canada or the US, which were much larger um, or, or, you know, relative to the amount of money that was actively managed in Australia. So I think it was that realization from an investing perspective that made me realize that um, consumers deserve to learn more about indexing. Um, but then I also saw the trends of, um, you know, digital and online really, um, you know, come as a wave through other industries I was trading at UBS, like retail and travel and, and media. 
and just thought that financial services was an industry stuck in the dark ages where everyone would, you know, go and see a, you know, see a person face to face. And there was not really a, a delightful digital experience that people could have um, when it comes to managing their money. So I thought I could marry up these two, I guess, realizations that things were going more digital and then more money which should be indexed invested as opposed to actively invested to, to start a business. So what is Stockspot doing now and, and how do you respond to folk that say that online and digital investment platforms are for folk who have got small amounts of money um, compared to those that might have large or significant amount, amounts of money? You look at uh, online solutions in the US, for example, the market's a trillion dollar market. It's it's huge. What, what are Australians missing when it comes to online uh, or robo-style uh, investing? Well, yeah, I mean, first of all, for the, for the, for the benefit of the listeners, like robo-advice or robo-investing is, is basically a, a digital product, and this is what Stockspot does, that first of all, um, ask some questions about your personal situation to determine, first of all, if investing is appropriate at all. So we, we say to people that have high interest debt or don't have enough of a savings buffer, Look, go pay off your debt first, but go build up some savings because the last thing you want to do is dip into your investments to, to cover short-term expenses. Um, but if investing is appropriate, we recommend an asset allocation and the underlying investments that we think are most appropriate for your situation, um, you know, an, an investment horizon to reach your goals. Um, and, and based on the evidence, you know, we think that those investments are typically low-cost index funds, you know, in an asset allocation that reflects the risk that you have the capacity to take. And so we basically manage that whole process for clients um, all through the kind of starting journey through to kind of learning about what they're investing in um, through to doing all of the portfolio management on an ongoing basis, like rebalancing and then doing all the tax and administration um, with the idea that, you know, we, we know a lot of people out there know that they should be investing, but just don't have the time or willingness to do it if they had to do it on their own. So we try and make it really simple. Um, so that's a bit about what, what um, robot advice is. I mean, on your other question of why there's a perception that it's kind of for beginners. I mean, I think this sort of centers around this idea that um, people think that in any part of their life, the, the more you pay for something, kind of the more you're gonna get. And I think people look at online, you know, investing robo advice or, you know, automated investing businesses like Stockspot and say, look, the, the fees are quite low, you know, therefore like, you know, the returns are not going to be any good because in order to earn good returns, I go and need to go into an office, speak to someone in a suit, you know, get access to great deals and IPOs and, and that's what's going to make me money. Um, and so I think it's a perception problem where, um, you know, people don't really appreciate that the returns you can get from a low cost portfolio are probably going to be better than what you can get from a, a much more sophisticated or complex portfolio over the long run. And why do you and, say that, Chris? Why do you why do you say that you can get better, probably better returns with low cost? Well, I mean, it all comes down to. I mean, if if you go to the other scenario of, of uh, you know a, a private couple that are going, let's say, to a private client advisor offering IPOs. Now, th these IPOs on, only get offered to the private client people if all of the smart instos say no. So there isn't like a free arbitrage in making money from great deals if you're a private individual. You know, the great deals end up going to the most sophisticated investors that can afford to pay for it and and, and that have you know all of the knowledge. And so. Typically what happens, unfortunately, for retail investors is that um, they don't get access to the best deals. They don't get access to the best funds. And even if they are getting access to the best actively managed funds, usually the fund managers manage them are smart enough to know how to monetize their own skills. And so they're charging high enough fees where most of the return benefit actually goes to the person managing the money as opposed to the person providing the capital. And so I, I don't think, um, I think people are hopeful that you know, uh, that there's this ability to access all of this great, great deal flow and, and great trading ideas. Um, but the reality is that um, if you're being offered trading ideas as someone with, you know, $100,000 or even a few million dollars, um, you know, there's bigger fish up there that have said no um, to that deal. Um, and I, yeah, I think you know, people don't appreciate that, but all of the evidence also points to this. So if you have a look at the performance of, you know, a low cost index portfolio, you know, whether it's ours or Vanguard's or, you know, others that other people run, um, the, the performance over any period of time is going to um, put you in the top quartile of investors. Um, and, and, you know, in many cases, much higher than that. So, yeah, I mean, it's a combination of the evidence, but just 
I mean, logically, people, I think, should understand that, um, yeah, that, that they're not going to be the ones that get the great um, information. It's someone else, probably. One of the things that uh, Stockspot does, Chris, is you run a, uh, prepare a report that's, I think, called uh, Fit Cats and Fat Cats. Can you give us a 30 second rundown of what that report is and what it is that you're trying to achieve from that? Because I've got a ton of questions going on from that. Yeah, sure. So um, back in 2013, when I was starting Stockspot, um, I was doing a lot of research at the same time into the superannuation industry in Australia. And it really bamboozled me as to why so much of the money in Australia was actively managed. I mean, we talked a little bit earlier about this um, kind of the zero sum nature of investing. And, and so it always seemed very strange to me that we have trillions of dollars basically invested in markets actively through our super. Um, but for every fund that does slightly better at one year, there's going to inevitably be a fund that does slightly worse. And after costs are accounted for, you know, it, it basically means there's billion, billions of dollars in fees that we're paying for really no net benefit. And, and so I thought it was this was something that it was important to kind of educate consumers. And I thought the best way to educate consumers was actually through data. Um, so what I did originally in 2013 and have every year since is got as much information as I possibly can about as many super funds as I could in Australia. Um, you know, in Australia, there's obviously hundreds and hundreds of different super funds. In fact, there's thousands. Um, so the first year, I think I got 400. I literally went to all of the websites and, and collected this data on the returns and, and fees from different super funds. Um, over the years, we, we ended up getting a bit more sophisticated. We started to buy this data from third parties. Um, but actually, when we started to publish this report showing which were the worst um, super funds in Australia, which we call fat cat funds, um, the providers of that data actually stopped providing us the data um, because they, they um, yeah, got in trouble with the funds who were supplying the data. So we realized we basically had to go at it ourselves, ourselves in, in actually collating this data and then publishing it in a way that was, um, you know, easily understandable by consumers. Um, so, yeah, for us, it's an educational initiative that we've done for, um, yeah, I think this is probably our seventh or eighth year now. Um, and really every year the findings are the same, which is that um, the, the super funds that charge higher fees um, tend to do worse. Um, that tends to be even more obvious over longer periods of time. So over one year, you know, it's a bit random whether a super fund does well or, or, or poorly, but over five or 10 years, it's absolutely clear that the funds that charge higher fees um, do worse than the funds that charge lower fees. And, and this, you know, is intuitively, you know, makes a lot of sense because um, compounding one and a half or 2% a year in fees over five years means that they had, you know, seven or 10% of fees to overcome in their performance just to get back to even. And not many funds have the ability to do that. Why do you think, Chris, invested, because there are hundreds, if not thousands of funds available for investors to choose from. Why do people accept high fees? And why do the funds themselves continue to quite frankly gouge investors with these high fees when I think that they should have a, a moral obligation to, I think there should be some level of reason, reasonableness to, to the fees that they should charge um, investors. But I, I just, I'm actually bamboozled. I don't, one, I don't know why people are paying the fees. Two, I don't know why the providers are charging the fees they are charging because, quite frankly, it is, it is fee gouging. Well, yes. I mean, maybe starting on the second one, which is why are funds charging higher fees? I mean, I think a lot of super funds and their trustees genuinely believe that they're smarter than everyone else. And that, that they. Can't you see it year after? So you said one year, two years is okay. Three, five, seven, 10 years constant underperformance to a relative simple benchmark how, how do you justify continuing to charge one and a half to two percent yeah i mean to me it, it seems quite bizarre i mean i think you know there is obviously some financial incentives for some of these funds to charge higher fees but it, yeah as fiduciaries or you know from a trustee obligation perspective i think it's very difficult to justify given the data you know i think the reason they you know have higher costs you know, they try to justify to themselves that, you know, they think if they pay an asset consultant to pick great fund managers, that that's going to allow them to kind of stand out and do better. Um, what surprises me is not that they kind of initially might believe that, 
but that after five and 10 years of evidence, um, you know, to the contrary, that it doesn't change their opinion. Um, you know, it, it really baffles me that if you look at almost any super fund in Australia on their like investment pages of their websites, they'll talk about how they, you know, how they think they can actively time the market and pick which are the best asset classes and use active fund managers to deliver our performance. Um, you know, when there's really no academic or empirical evidence that this is the case, you know, some of the funds that have performed quite well also disguise the fact that they've actually just taken higher risk in order to achieve those returns. So something that our, our research points out each year is that um, a lot of these funds that have done well have, have done so just because they've taken more risk and, and they've miscategorized risk as actually the smarts of their outperformance. And that's something we think is just as important to highlight um, because there's, a, there's a, a risk that people just end up putting money in funds that they think have are done well because they've outperformed when really they've just taken higher risk and, and that um, can unwind very quickly in a, in a market that's not as favorable. Um, so that's, I mean, that's why funds charge more. I think they, they believe that they should be, even though it, it really, you know, I, I don't quite understand how they can believe that for so long. I mean, in terms of why consumers are willing to pay for it, I think, unfortunately, there's a few reasons. Um, financial services is, is definitely an area broadly where there's an asymmetry of information. You know, the people who are, um, you know, investing as retail investors don't have the same level of information as the people providing investments. I don't think... Most people appreciate the costs of compounding costs over a long period of time. I think if you tell the average person that, you know, if you pay 2% a year out of your, out of your um, returns, like does that seem high or low? Most people would say that's reasonable and they probably wouldn't be able to visualize um, that in 40 or 50 years paying the difference between 2% and um, paying half a percent a year in fees is likely to add up even for the average Australian to two or $300,000. Um, so I think there's a, there's a lack of ability to, to visualize. I think there's also um, the fact that a lot of people are just defaulted into a fund and those funds may not, may not necessarily be good. So the default nature of super means that we've never had to make a choice about it and people just um, sort of are apathetic. And I think there's also a level of confusion. Um, you know, just like at the supermarket, when we go and see 50 different types of toothpaste, you know, that doesn't help us get clarity on what sort of toothpaste we need. You know, do I need the extra whitening, the sensitive gums? Like that makes us more confused. And I think having so many super funds in Australia um, makes it quite overwhelming for people to make a decision. And so they end up just doing nothing. One thing I was really surprised to see was um, AMP's Capital Dynamics Market Fund. Let me, it's a mouthful. AMP Capital's Dynamic Markets Fund, which returned negative 16% over the past year and negative 2.08% for a five-year period. So for five years, people lost 2% per annum. Am I, re am I understanding that right? Yeah, that's right. I, think, I mean, it was the first time in our eight-year report that there's actually been a fund with negative performance over five years. I and mean, is that a, a, it's a balanced fund, right? So, you know, it should be balanced and it, and it, well, it doesn't appear to have done what it was supposed to do over two years. Now that portfolio, if I understand right, is managed by uh, AMP, AMP's Shane Oliver. Is that right? Uh, yeah. I think there's a couple of fund managers, but sure. I, I think, yeah, he's definitely been touted as um, someone whose ideas go into that portfolio. Right. <laughs> I think I've got a lot of respect for, for Shane. I think he's a really, really smart guy and how he interprets, how he interprets markets and information and, and all of those things. And Shane does a really good job in providing clear, um, concise explanations around what's going on and, and why. I'm interested in your point of view, Chris, at, um, when it comes to um, people who are seen to be um, experts in a, in a particular area. And then when it comes to managing money and executing ideas, why is there such a disconnect between, between the two? Well, I mean, I think there's just a very different skill set required. So I think, I mean, there are some people out there in Australia that are fantastic at being able to describe what's going on in the economy, you know, put it into layman's terms, you know, really understand what's currently um, embodied in the price. You know, whether that's the, you know, the price of shares or bonds or other asset classes. And, and yeah, he's probably one of those people that has a great way to articulate 
um, what's going on to the average person out there. Um, but just being able to describe what's going on in the world doesn't necessarily give you any edge or any ability to, um, you know, beat others when it comes to predicting what's going to happen in the future. Um, and, and I think, you know, th this fund is probably a good example of that. It's probably one of the most active products, um, you know, in the, you know, in, in the category in terms of, you know, super options. It, it tries to determine what asset classes to be, you know, in, into, which ones to be out of. You know, there's obviously some very sophisticated models they have behind the scenes trying to determine this. Um, yeah, the, the problem is that, Having a sophisticated model doesn't mean you're able to, you know, beat the market. The market's pretty smart, and I think especially when it comes to macroeconomics, um, where there's a lot of money at stake and a lot of players, it's, it's actually very difficult to um, beat the market over the long run. I, I think it's probably easier in very niche areas where there's less people looking and there's less competition. Can you, you know? give an example of one of those areas, Chris? Well, I mean, when I, when I was trading cross-listed arbitrage, that was a great example. It was just after the financial crisis, a, a lot of hedge funds and investment banks stopped trading that strategy. And so basically there was a whole lot of money to be made and nobody going after those profits. And I think, you know, when you're running a hedge fund or you're looking for ability to add edge, you're looking for things that other people aren't seeing and you're looking for things that, not, things that people aren't looking for or um, you have some extra skill or, or ability to take advantage of them. And I think when it comes to macroeconomic forecasts, that's extremely difficult because you've got, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of people analyzing every data point as soon as it comes out from the RBA or the Federal Reserve or wherever. Um, your ability to consistently be smarter than all of those other very smart people is almost next to nothing. I mean, even, you know, even the, the people touted to be the smartest in the world, like Ray Dalio and his Bridgewater Fund, um, you know, have, have had periods of doing very well, but also periods of doing poorly. Um, so I think, yeah, macroeconomic decisions are even harder than probably stock picking in small caps. And so it, it makes sense to me why a fund that tries to have a dy dynamic view of what's going on in the macro world, you know, probably is not going to beat the market. And if it, their fees are high, they're probably going to do poorly. You, when you talk about, when you mention Ray Dalio, I'm a... Uh, a fan of Ray and I listen to a lot of what he's got to say. Uh, but when you listen to what he's got to say, he, paint, he paints a very pessimistic picture of the world. But then you look at Bridgewater's funds and their asset allocation. It's not like the fund's completely in cash and gold. The fund invests in a whole bunch of things. So what he's saying on one hand paints one picture, but then when you take a look at the actions of what is actually going on, it's worlds apart. And, and, and I guess... How, how much time do you think, Chris, investors and whether it's retail or sophisticated investors, how much time do you think they should be spending uh, listening to these so-called experts who are on Sky News, who are on CNBC and Bloomberg and the like? Well, I mean, I, my, my personal view is that like probably the worst thing you can do as an investor is listen to people that you, you think are smart because it's going to make you probably act um, and, and we know for most people, when it comes to long-term investing, the worst thing you can do is act, you know, buy or sell or, or make decisions to get in and out. Um, you know, the, there are lots of examples that I've seen sort of even anecdotally of people, you know, trying to time the market because they saw a smart person on the news that said that they expected a crash or, you know, the market to fall further, who, who got out of investing. Um, and then when the person's prediction either didn't come to fruition or it, or it did, but then it reversed very quickly. And this year is a good example. They never got back into markets. And then they were waiting on the sidelines for, you know, five or 10 years um, and, and, and missing out on returns. And so I think the challenge with trying to time the market based on experts is that, you know, experts will get on TV and tell you that the market's overvalued or that it's going down, but they usually won't tell you, you know, where's their stop loss or where, you know, where do they, you know, question their conviction on this call. And they also probably won't get on there and tell you when to buy back in. And in order to time the market well, you actually need to get two decisions right. You need to know when to get out and you also need to go when to get back in. And I think that's the probably side that a lot of people miss is that, you know, it's very easy to make the decision to, to, to get out. But, um, you know, it's very hard when the market falls 30, 30% like it did earlier this year to be the person that says, all right, I'm, you know, I, I was right. The market's fallen. I'm going to start to get back in. I'm going to dollar cost average and slowly buy or I'm going to put it all back in. Um, 
You know, we, you know, we even have clients that, you know, correctly last year took some money out of markets, but then when the market had fallen 30%, they thought, oh, well, it's going to fall 50 or 60%. So I'm going to wait for that to happen. Um, so yeah, getting two sides of the trade is extremely difficult, which is, you know, why my, my view is that you shouldn't be listening to these expert opinions. I think there are some great slides I've seen online of all of the expert calls of, of the market falling in, and, and these are people who said the market was going to fall in 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and what returns these people missed out on if you listen to them. Um, so over the long run, yeah, listening to experts' opinions on markets, I think is, is for most people going to do more harm than good. It's the, uh, the classic Australia's falling into recession next year call. Um, th- yeah, they eventually be, got it right. In- right. One year out of 35. Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, what do you, Chris, what do you think? We talk about um, media and financial media. What role do you think financial media has in all of this in, um, if you like, supporting this type of thinking, this type of philosophy when it comes to, to money management? Do you think they've got a role or to play in all of this or they're completely segregated from it all and and their job is to try and get listeners and ears pinned to whatever it is that they're saying? I mean, I think the challenge with um, the media has is that the, the loudest voices in financial services tend to be the guys with the biggest budgets who tend to be the guys charging the biggest fees who tend to be the guys that are you know actively trying to beat the market. And, and these are the guys that are pumping out press releases each day you know, talking about their one fund that's done well, and probably not talking about their 10 funds that haven't done well. And so, you know, I think journalists have a bit of a challenge in actually sifting through this to work out, you know, what's really going on. Um, But I I think they owe it to um, their readership to really critique, um, you know, critique what's going on, and and actually provide a, a counter view or some critical analysis, um, you know, which some do well, but you know, some don't do well, I think, Um, you know, I think there's always a lot more stories to tell when it comes to active investing, because there's always companies company coming out with earnings releases. You know, there's always a fund manager that's done well. And, and so if you're always reporting on those stories, um, you tend not to report on the story that, hey, even though there are some companies like Afterpay that are doing well, there's also, you know, 90% of companies that aren't doing well. Um, and, and you tend also not to report on the fact that even though this one fund manager has made a 50% return this year, um, actually, in a year where fund managers probably should have done well because the market's fallen, you know, 60% of them have still done poorly. And so I think it's important to really, um, you know, provide a, a broader context for consumers and, and, you know, not anchor them to these kind of stories that don't really tell them the, the real story of what's going on. There's a couple of things I want to touch on. Um, you've, you, you mentioned um, focusing and spending time on the winners. Um, JP Morgan recent, not recently, but have done uh, a report. I can't remember the exact name of it, but basically what they did was they uh, looked at the Russell uh, 3000 index in the US from 1980. And what they found was, was that uh, 40% of those stocks suffered a permanent loss of around 70%. And in fact, it was only 7% of stocks in the index that actually moved the index forward over that time frame. Seven percent of stocks out of the Russell out of three thousand stocks, seven percent. Why do we not pay attention to these numbers? Why are investors not paying attention to these facts, to this to these uh, this research and this evidence that's being put out there? Uh, because certainly the odds of trying to pick the seven percent that basically move the market. Why are we not spending time thinking and looking at any of this stuff, Chris? Well, I mean, clearly you and I think about it. I think it's one of the sexiest studies that's come out of it. <laughs> You're insane, like man. No well. one's going to read it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there's two studies that have both shown this, one by JP Morgan, another one by a, 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 a researcher called Baspinda. One was from the 80s and one was even further back from the early 1900s. Both of them showed the same thing, which was that um, between four to seven percent of companies drive all of the economic return in the share market. So if you don't own those companies, you, you're going to have ended up with a worse result than just leaving your money in the bank. Um, I think a lot of people just assume if they pick a share at random on the share market or just pick a share um, that they're probably going to do all right. I, I don't think they appreciate that they're actually probably going to do badly. And, and actually, unless they're exposed to these these companies that have 
you know, done thousand and two thousand and ten thousand percent returns, um, they're actually not going to get a good return from the market. And uh, yeah, I think sort of that's one side of it. But also, I think with hindsight bias, people think that they can pick that four to seven percent of companies. So yeah, Robert, whenever I mention this to people, they're like, well, that's fine. I mean, just pick a fund manager that's good at picking those those companies. Or I mean, I, I think I can pick them. I, I go online, I do my research. I've heard that Apple's a good stock and, and Afterpay is a good stock. Um, they also don't, yeah, appreciate that with hindsight, you know, it's easy to pick the ones that have already done well. It's much harder to pick the ones that are going to do well over the next 10 and 20 years. Um, and, and those four or 7% of shares are, are constantly changing as well. So, um, uh, yeah, it, it's a message I often hear and, and see um, active fund managers talk about, which is that, you know, you don't want to invest in the index because you're going to own all these dogs. You're going to own these stocks that do poorly. And, and only by picking an active manager can you truly sift through all of these dog companies and only end up with the best companies. Um, you know, there are all sorts of problems with this argument, but I think the biggest one is it misses out on the problem with active management is sometimes it misses out on these great companies. And even if you miss out on the dogs, if you've avoided investing in these four to 7% of companies, you're also going to get an awful return. And I think this is something that a lot of um, value managers in Australia have realized over the last few years, you know, even though they may have a pretty good skill in, in avoiding some, um, you know, some landmines in their portfolio, they've, um, for whatever reason, not had a lot of these companies that have had astronomical returns, you know, whether it's the tech, big tech companies in the US or, or, you know, some high growth sectors in Australia. And because of that, their funds have underperformed. Um, and, and, you know, I, I would be the last person to have predicted that, you know, these, these tech stocks will have, would have done so well, or that Afterpay would have gone from $8 to $80. But guess what? It doesn't matter. They're all in the index. And, and so our clients have benefited from these companies, even though we didn't predict it. They're probably, I reckon 15 years ago, there was this cachet dealing with a JP Morgan, dealing with the UBS, that you would have access to UBS's daily research, etc. UBS launched, and I can't remember what year it was, maybe in the mid to, mid to late 2000s, they launched an ETF. And the ETF basically traded, bought and sold UBS's recommendations, right? So if UBS had a, recommend, had a recommended buy on Coca-Cola, the ETF would buy the stock and it had a sell on BHP, it would sell the stock. So investors by buying this ETF had access to uh, UBS's IP, right? That ETF shut down pretty quickly. Um, do you know which one I'm talking about, Chris? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I do remember it. And I think it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's a very similar scenario to the AMP fund we discussed earlier, which is that, you know, even with the smartest researchers in the world, um, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get a great outcome from investing. Um, do you think that cache dealing with a JP Morgan or a UBS is, um, is still valued or that's not important in this day and age with access to information, um, access to investment products now that we may not have had 15, 20 years ago. Accessing offshore markets has certainly become the easiest and cheapest it has ever been. Um, how much does that stuff matter anymore, Chris? Well, I think it still matters to some people. I think some people really do want that feeling of walking into a, you know, a beautiful office with, uh, you know, gold chandelier, you know, stepping into a, a room with a lovely view and, and five people in a suit that want to tell you where the world's headed. Um, people want that. You know, there are definitely people that want that. They want to feel important. They want to feel like they're getting the access to the great deals and access to information. Um, yeah, I don't think that will change. There'll always be people that want that. Um, what I think is happening is there's people that have had that um, that are wisening up to the fact that it, it, it's um, it's all a bit of a charade, really. Um, you know, it's an all a bit of a song and dance. What do you mean it's a charade? Why is it a charade? Well, it's a charade because um, the, the performance doesn't stack up. I mean, you can certainly get that feeling of feeling important, but a lot of people that have, um, you know, used this sort of style of investing or having their wealth managed, um, looking back at their performance over five or 10 years and comparing it just to a simple portfolio of index funds are asking themselves, wait a second. I mean, I, I, 
you know, I, I got all of this sort of fancy access to all these different things. I, you know, I got a lot of attention. Um, you know, I paid these guys a lot of fees. And after I paid all these fees, my performance is no better or, or potentially worse than had I just done something really simple and not spoken to anyone. Um, so I think, yeah, I think there's a more of an awakening happening with more people. Um, you know, maybe in the 100 years ago, these um, private bankers could give you access to better information and better IPOs and there was a, a financial justification for, for using them. Um, now, I think, I mean, good advice is, is actually not around, you know, getting access to deals, but actually more behavioural, making sure that people can understand, you know, all of the potential scenarios that can play out in markets and, and understand, you know, the importance of keeping a, a hold on your behaviour in those different scenarios. You know, I think that sort of financial education you know, is becoming more valued. And the idea that you're going to get access to special hedge funds or special deals, I think is getting devalued. And yeah. And so I think it's leading to probably new businesses out there that are more focused on areas of investing that are proven to add value and less focus on the areas that aren't. I want to sort of head down the, the finish line now, Chris, with the title of this particular conversation was Janitor to Philanthropist. And I, I've just finished reading Morgan Housel's book, uh, the, the Book of Psychology, and or The Psychology of Money. And he makes reference to a couple of uh, stories, which I have heard before, but it was, a, it, was a, it was a timely reminder. There was a gentleman by the name of Ronald Reed, who was a janitor and I think a a gas station attendant in the U S he lived a very, very minimalist life. He didn't have many friends, didn't have many hobbies. And for what I read, he just sort of kept to himself, worked and, and went home. And I think his favorite pastime was chopping firewood is, um, is what the internet tells me. He passed away at in 2015, I think at the age of 92, his estate was revealed to be worth eight and a half million dollars. He, donated in excess of $5 million to the uh, local library and I think a couple of local hospitals uh, as well. Contrast that in some parallel universe, Richard Fusconi, who was in fact a, a, an executive at Merrill Lynch, uh, Harvard educated, uh, an MBA, he, when he finished up at uh, Merrill Lynch, um, the then CEO, David K uh, Kamansky, said, business savvy, leadership skills, sound judgment and personal integrity. Fusconi declared bankruptcy in 2010 to stop foreclosure on his 19,000 square foot, 11 bathroom mansion. I quote, I have been devastated by the financial crisis, which came to a head in March 2008. I currently have no income. How is it that one man who uh, doesn't have the highest paying job on this planet accumulates a uh, balance sheet or net worth of in excess of $8 million. And then you've got someone with all the connections in the world. You've got someone who is very educated, highly educated in the world of finance, uh, who has all the networks, all the skills that anyone can imagine, who literally ends up bankrupt. How does that, how do you think that actually happens, Chris? Well, I mean, the, the first example, the janitor, he actually, now that you describe uh, his life, sounds like he was probably the first person that lived the fire movement, the, you know, financially independent, retire early. It sounds like this person sort of chipped away at, at just saving um, whatever he could. Um, you know, whenever he could, he was probably, um, you know, quite, quite prudent um, and, you know, lived a modest life and, and just was very consistent and disciplined in how he invested and, and how he tucked his money away whenever possible. Um, you know, on, on the flip side, I mean, it, it's really, a, this is a story of the tortoise and the hare. You know, it, it's, it doesn't seem like the right strategy at the time to just be disciplined and make small changes and small amounts of savings. Um, but if you do that in a consistent way, you do benefit from the power of compounding. And, and the power of compounding isn't visible on, on day one when you're a janitor and you can only save, you know, $10 in that first year, but it does hit you after 50 years where you've done that um, consistently and grown your savings over your lifetime. I mean, I think on, on the flip side, 
you know, you've got someone who, you know, is kind of living more of a, you know, a financial Ferrari life where, you know, you can go super fast and get super, super ahead of everyone else at some point. Um, but eventually the bad habits that you're bringing into your investing or into your lifestyle are going to come to hit you and you're going to have some sort of car accident um, that's going to bring everything to a halt. Um, and, and whether it's leverage that does that or whether it's, you know, you know, your lifestyle or concentration risk, there's all sorts of bad habits, I think, that people who are confident and overconfident in their ability can bring into their investing that, that ultimately can be their undoing. Um, so, I mean, the story sort of doesn't surprise me. I think they're kind of great stories, great stories to sort of tell more people. I haven't read, um, yeah, Morgan Husel's book yet, but um, yeah, I'm sure he's got lots of other wonderful anecdotes out there. But I think it's the story we try and tell our clients as well, that when it comes to investing, like boring is brilliant. You actually want investing not to be exciting. If, if, if investing is exciting, it's probably actually gambling that you're doing. It's probably speculation and gambling. Um, you may have some wins and you'll probably feel a bit of dopamine on the, on, along the way. But, you know, if you're really trying to set yourself up to have wealth over the long run and be able to achieve your personal goals, um, you know, that that's may not be the right strategy. Warren Buffett's eight, $81.5 billion of his $84.5 billion net worth came after his 65th birthday. 81 and a half of the 84 and a half came after his 65th birthday. How do investors balance the fine line between saving and investing for tomorrow and living a life that's enjoyable now while I'm fit, healthy, sane and, 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 and whatnot? Because the, more, the less and less I do now, because that's the concept of compounding and, and saving and, and whatnot, do less now so you can do more later. Like, I, I mean, quite frankly, I don't want to wait till 65 or 70 so I can do stuff that I want to do now. How do, you, how, how, do you, how do you talk to investors about that concept of doing stuff that you want to do now, but understanding that's going to have an impact on your tomorrow Compare that to do nothing, well, not do nothing now, but do less now and save for tomorrow. How do, how do we balance that as investors? I mean, I think it's a di difficult one for, for us as humans to kind of visualize because being able to have some level of gratification now is very tempting versus the potential to have some sort of gratification in the future. Um, uh, even though that future gratification may be much bigger than what you could potentially get now, I think a lot of people do choose, um, you know, to take now over the future. Um, I think a lot of the research has shown that one of the best ways to do it is to actually ask, ask people to visualize themselves in the future, um, you know, visualize where they want to be, you know, self-visualization kind of helps people determine what's important. Um, but I think, I mean, you make a good point and I think it, it differs for different people. Um, some people um, do put a higher priority on things that they need now. Um, you know, others, you know, may not. I think it's just helping educate people that there is a balance um, and, and letting people make their own decisions. I, I don't think it's necessarily wrong to want to be able to spend more now or enjoy your life now. You know, I, I definitely think it's a, it's something we kind of see with the younger generation now, like, you know, millennials, you know, there is a sort of sense that, you know, you know, why are we having to make sacrifices um, you know, when we, we don't, we don't really need to be making those sacrifices. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like it's a balance that everyone just needs to understand what the balance is and then they can make their own personal decisions around how much they're prepared to sacrifice now um, versus the future. Um, I mean, it also, I think it's also something that you become more self-aware with as you get older is like what, you know, what really is important in the near term to you. I think when, when I was young, I probably, valued a lot of things that are, you know, that were more sort of tangible that I, I no longer really care about. So in the near term, you know, time and family are, are more important for me. And, and really that's not something that, you know, you, you have to sort of spend money on. And so you can still afford to be able to save and, and you know, be, spend, spend, be spending time with your family. What do you think, Chris, is the biggest problem in the financial uh, advisory financial services industry right now? What pisses you off about the industry, Chris? Um, I mean, I think it's a broad one, but I, I mean, I think this is something that kind of really crosses across lots of areas of financial services, but it's, 
it's basically, um, you know, poorly set up incentives. Um, so whose incentives? Know, yeah, mis misincentives of, of the, you know, people acting for clients. Um, so, you know, I think a good example um, is, um, yeah, businesses who are providing advice to clients who also have some sort of direct relationship with the products that they're recommending. You know, I've been very clear about that for many years. We made a submission to the Royal Commission, you know, specifically on this. I just don't see any way that that can be resolved um, unless there is like a clear separation between people providing advice and, and products. Um, but also, I mean, conflicts even happen, I think, in, across like ratings in Australia, for instance. So I think a lot of great financial products don't get discovered because they're not prepared to pay the businesses that do the ratings. And the ratings um, businesses are, you know, gatekeepers to a lot of money in Australia. So money ends up going to businesses that are prepared to pay money to get, you know, some sort of accreditation or badge, um, even though the process of, of doing that, you know, makes them worse products. How much value do you place on ratings, Chris? Uh, well, on our Fat Cat uh, ratings, I place a lot of value. On, uh, you know, different gold star ratings that circulate around the in industry, I, I don't put a lot of value on. You know what ratings I'm talking about, Chris, don't you? I, I wouldn't, yeah, <laughs> put it this way, I, I wouldn't be picking my super fund based on how many gold badges they have on their website because I understand that how the process works that they basically pay for those gold badges or, for you know, there's different ways that, um, you know, that they can get them. Um, but also the, one of the big problems I have with the ratings process is, is the, the lack of rigour. Um, you know, when it comes to even understanding the risks that different funds are taking, and this is something, you know, we've brought up in several um, forums, you know, the ratings agencies in Australia, to, to a large extent, just take whatever the funds give them and, and accept their asset allocations as, as what they're told, as opposed to doing any more scrutiny or digging. Um, you know, part of it is kind of, I think, falls on the ratings agency, but part of it, I think, falls on the government to improve the transparency of the funds themselves, um, because most super funds don't provide a lot of detail about what they've actually invested in. How challenging do you think it is, Chris, for money managers to maintain a long-term view of their, the, the pool that they are stewards of and, and managing, whilst at the same time making sure that their short-term numbers look good because a lot of these ratings and, and agencies we we talk about look at quarterly returns and i'm not sure how much you can measure over a, of a over a quarter but i'm just curious to know how you think money managers manage or should manage that discrepancy between short-termism but doing the right thing and managing the money over the long run for investors well, I mean, if I think about how we, we look at it, I mean, we don't really care about ratings because we don't get rated by anyone. And so our focus is on making sure that the strategies we've recommended are the most appropriate strategies for the time horizons and, and the profiles of the investors we're making them for. So, you know, if we've got a strategy that, you know, we're saying is appropriate for someone investing for seven plus years, you know, we want to make sure that it does work out to be appropriate for someone investing for seven plus years. So, you know, for us, that pushes our thinking to be kind of longer term. Um, shorter term is important from more of an investor behavioural perspective. Um, so it's still something to consider. Um, the, the risk in a portfolio is, is not something that you can just ignore. And if you make a, a good long term return, you know, 2020 is a great example because markets did fall 30 to 40 percent over a couple of months, you know, which was the fastest fall since 1987, you know, having an asset allocation that kept clients calm and invested over that time was uh, extremely important. Now that asset allocation, you know, probably didn't help their performance in 2019 because having an asset allocation that can withstand a big market fall means having more bonds and gold and assets like these in your portfolios, which were probably a drag in years where markets um, did quite well. Um, so, you know, what, what we do to clients is in, in years where um, they have good performance, but maybe not as good as some of their friends, we explain to them, you know, why that is that, you know, we didn't, you know, we don't try and predict what's going to happen, but there were all sorts of different things that could have happened this year. And in the scenario that we didn't have a good year and we had a bad year, you would have done a lot better than your friends. Um, so, yeah, for us, it's about educating clients. So we're not trying to predict the future. We're trying to just prepare 
for lots of different possible futures. And in order to do that, you've got to accept that you're not going to get the highest return every year. The media has this obsession, I reckon, Chris, of t- telling investors about when and which year is the year to be investing in active management. And in 2020, I picked up a, a Bloomberg forecast of you know all the major money managers and what their forecasts were. And you know the prevailing uh, advice was that this is a year for, for active management. And if things go poorly, you want to be in active management because active management is the place to be so that someone can preserve your capital. And lo and behold, we had a, a scenario where that would be tested. So markets got absolutely smashed from February to, to, to towards the end of March. And unfortunately, yet again, active management didn't stack up. They did not preserve uh, investor capital. Why do we keep going round and round and round in circles with this whole concept of uh, active management preserving capital in, in down markets, Chris? I mean, it's simple. It goes back to what we were talking about before, which is incentives. Um, active managers have a strong incentive to be um, telling this story. So I think, I mean, on your first point, I, I feel like every uh, big investment bank has a strategist with a press release that has this on auto send in January. Um, <laughs> That, that this is the year for active management. It's just a cut, copy and replace the year because I, I, I'm the same as you. Every year I feel like I see this press release coming out and uh, you know a few journalists picking it up that you know 2014, this is the year or 2015, this is the year. I mean, eventually there might be a year that it happens, but you, you make an extremely good point, which was this year should have been the year. In a year where the market falls by 30%, you know, it's been the biggest dispersion between stock returns that we've seen in many years. I mean, if there's ever a year for actively picking stocks and showing your skill, it's this year. I mean, the problem is that um, if active managers are relying on years like this to prove their skill, yet these are extremely hard years to predict it, it makes a lot of sense why they haven't been able to outperform, which is that, you know, active managers are about predicting. No one predicted a, a global pandemic that would, you know, have the impact on markets that it did over a couple of months. And then a a, um, you know, stimulus measures from a fiscal and monetary perspective in a coordinated, um, you know, around the world that would have, you know, the opposite effect on markets. Um, no, no one really predicted that. You know, some people predicted that markets were overvalued or they might fall. Very few predicted the rebound that I've seen. Um, so I think the problem is in, in prediction, it's always going to be difficult. Uh, and if you have a business model that relies on being able to predict the future, um, you're always going to struggle to to predict it. There's always going to be a couple that do. And I think this year, um, the stats, I think the SPIVA half year report has just come out in Australia, which is the kind of go to report about whether active managers are, are doing their job. And I think it's about 40% in, in Australian equities outperformed the market over the last year and 60% underperformed. It's like every other year, a bit of a flip of the coin. Um, but over longer periods, it becomes more evident that it's it's difficult. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, I don't think it should surprise anyone, but I, I think if I was a journalist, I would be thinking twice before publishing that article in January 2021 that this is the year of, for active management. It's really interesting. Uh, th- this year has been one of the craziest years. You know, if you think about a global pandemics, you think about the rebound in the stock market, you think about the president of the United States um, being diagnosed with COVID, like... If, if someone described this year to you, like, I just wonder how different your portfolio would look when compared to what it actually looked like. I'm just not sure how different it would actually be. I think that's a great point is if you told someone at this, um, if you told someone exactly what was going to happen this year and, and then said, okay, what do you want to do with your portfolio? I'm pretty sure they wouldn't have said like, well, let's load up on uh, tech shares um, because the NASDAQ's going to be 30% higher than it was in January. So I think that's an awesome point as well, which is that, even with the benefit of hindsight of what actually happened, that doesn't still allow you to predict what's going to happen in markets. You, I've got a couple of final questions before we wrap up. You hold, I believe, in some of your portfolios, a large portion in gold. And gold, man, I don't know what gold does for, for you and your portfolios. Sure, over the short term, it might cushion some of your volatility. But if you are genuine long-term investors that don't worry about short-term noise in the markets. Why are you allocating any money to gold? 
Uh, excellent question. And one we get a lot. I mean, we got a lot of that question, particularly in the few years that gold didn't perform very well, 2015 to 18. Now we tend to get more questions from our clients. Why can't I have more gold in my portfolio? Um, well, that's a separate question because that's totally crazy. Yeah. But that's the thing I question mean, is when you get out of it, you've got it in so, there, it worked. So, I mean, to give a bit of um, uh, perspective, like we have a 12% allocation in our portfolios to gold. So it's not a, it's not a large allocation, but it's, it's an allocation. Um, it, it's definitely bigger than what you'd probably see most traditional diversified funds having. Um, you know, how is it done for us? Well, having gold in our portfolio over the last five years has allowed us to outperform 99% of diversified funds. Um, but not only that, we've been able to really uh, reduce the risk compared to diversified funds um, because gold has a fantastic negative correlation with markets. So um, as an investor, gold is, is basically a, an insurance policy in your portfolio, just as government bonds are. And, and you could be asking the same question about government bonds. Why would you have any government bonds in your portfolio when in the long run equities are going to do better? I mean, it, it's not about the long-term performance of the asset class itself, um, but it's, it's about um, helping people sleep at night when the market has a 35% fall. So this year when the market had a 35% fall, um, our portfolios, even our most aggressive portfolio only fell by less than half of that. And our most conservative portfolio fell by less than 20% of that. And, and, and for me, that is the big benefit of gold in a portfolio it is it's an emotional benefit for people and it allows them to enjoy the long-term benefits of compounding because they don't touch their portfolio when markets fall. Uh, where a lot of other people, even if they had hoped to be investing for the long run, um, may make that poor decision to sell at the wrong time. And I think that can be seen, you know, in, in the broader context. Um, so it, it's certainly a controversial one. Um, yeah, I mean, I, as I've said earlier in the interview, like I, I'm not someone to kind of predict sort of uh, macroeconomics, but, you know, the, the reason why gold is doing particularly well at the moment is that we're in an environment of negative real interest rates and, and gold historically basically trades like a zero coupon inflation protected bond. Um, and in a world where, um, you know, bonds are basically trading at in zero interest rates, I, I very strongly believe that gold is something that people should have in their portfolios alongside government bonds, um, because there will be a scenario where government bonds don't provide the protection that they historically have. Um, and and I, I do think gold is likely to be the asset that protects clients in that scenario. Um, do you, with the price of gold today, are you looking at rebalancing your allocation, Chris, or do you just let it, let it run? How do you manage, manage that? Because so you presumably you want to be selling gold now and buying gold. Yeah, so in March this year, um, so, so I guess there's two questions there. So first of all, the, the strategic asset allocation in our portfolio doesn't change very often. So we've had 12% in gold since 2017. And 2017 was the only change we'd ever made to our strategic asset allocation, and it was to increase gold, which has ended up being a great decision. Um, the reason we did that wasn't because we thought gold was going to go up. It was because the correlation between government bonds and equities was weakening and, and therefore government bonds, um, you know, our view was based on the correlations wouldn't provide the level of protection needed if markets fell. Um, now, as it turns out, this is, has, has been correct. Government bonds haven't provided the level of protection they historically have because, because of the, you know, perceived zero bound and, and the RBA and other um, reserve banks, um, you know, lack of willingness to go beyond the zero bound. Um, and, and so gold has, has worked well. In terms of rebalancing, that's a different question to the strategic asset allocation. Um, we rebalance only when asset weights move a certain distance from their target weights. What is that distance, Chris? It varies per asset class and per portfolio, but um, you know, best, the, the evidence sort of out there is that you should allow assets to move a certain distance away. You shouldn't be rebalancing too often. Um, Typically, you know, the evidence shows it should be somewhere between uh, 15 to 30% away from its target weight before you should touch it. And, and you know, we've only re re rebalanced a couple of times over six years. So that gives you an idea of how infrequently we, we rebalance. Um, but in March 2020, um, because the share market fell so fast, um, the gold part of our portfolios for many clients increased to somewhere between 16 to 18% of their portfolio. 
And, and that week we actually did rebalance by selling some gold and redeploying that capital into equities. Pure um, so, skill, right, Chris? Well, I mean, the, the best thing is that it had nothing to do with skill. It was just about <laughs> an automated process. Um, you know, we woke up one morning and the markets had fallen so far that our process basically said, look, now is the time to be uh, harvesting some gains from gold and reinvesting into equities. You know, it, it didn't take any decision. And I think that was a great thing because I can't imagine there were too many investment committees, um, you know, sitting around that last week of March saying now is the right time to buy shares. It, it was the point where the world felt the worst. And I think that's why, you know, timing the market is difficult because it's always when things feel the worst and there is no light that is the right time to buy. A hundred percent. And I think systematic investing needs a bit more respect, certainly now in, in Australia, I think more investors would uh, remove a lot of the behavioral biases and behavioral mistakes that we make when it comes to investing, because we let our emotion take control and literally sit in the driver's seat of decision-making when in fact we should be looking at what is the process and looking at the process more so than what is actually going on right now because generally over the long run, if your process is, is, is good and it's thorough and it's well thought through, um, it, in, in time, it, it generally does, does work. I've got one more question, Chris, before we wrap up. We've um, gone a few minutes over than, than what I um, had planned. We're sitting in the year 2023. What is the biggest regret investors have made? Uh, well, the biggest regret be, investors have. Biggest, just to be a bit cheeky, I'd say uh, not buying gold in 2020. You can't use that answer, man. Something <laughs> else. Give me something else. Well, as in the biggest regret that they didn't do now? Yeah, what did they do or didn't do? What's, what, what is the big thing they've regretted? Sitting here in 2023, looking back. I mean, I, I feel like I can stick to my answer. I feel like um, if you have a look at the weight of assets um, that are truly uncorrelated in people's portfolios at the moment, they're, they're much lower than I think they'll be in 2023. Um, so I think um, there will be asset classes that they look back on and think, you know, not why didn't I have all my money in that asset class, but why wasn't that part of my portfolio? And I think um, it's likely that, that um, you know, that will be one of them. Chris, I, I love speaking with you. What we talk about is not sexy. It's not exciting. It's not going to make the front page of the newspaper or it's not going to be on uh, breaking news on Reuters or on Bloomberg, unfortunately. But I think if more and more investors took a uh, page out of this book, I think it would make a tremendous difference in both their personal lives and also their financial lives. Thank you so much for joining me today, Chris. Um, I hope to speak to you again soon. Yeah, my pleasure. And yeah, uh, great work with the podcast. Look forward to hearing more of your interviews. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. See you, Chris.